over the land until I began to get disturbed. I said, God, I know there's a way. And there's a way that we can have a peace of mind that we can be assured and that we can be established on a foundation that we can't be jostled and moved and tossed about by every wind of God. So I've taken on myself to reconsider my thoughts and just drop everything that I had heard man preach and talk about and his ideas and traditions and all like that. And I just went to God for my understanding. I'm not a college graduate. I want to, you, you all know that. I haven't even been to Bible school. That is a man teaching. But I have been to school. But I went to God's school. school. And he taught me. And how he taught me was by the revelation of the Spirit to understand his plan. Did you know why the world's in such a chaos, confusion today? It's because they don't know God's plan. And they don't know how his plan was fulfilled, who fulfilled that plan, and what it was fulfilled by. Did you know that? Now that question that I said right there, I, I say a question, a remark to me. But did you take that in consideration now that you know it? Now we asked ourselves a question. Do we understand the plans of God? Do we understand when that plan began and who began that plan and how it was fulfilled? Now that's one thing I want my people to know and I want everyone else to know. I say when I started my way to, to explain and to seek for the knowledge and wisdom of God, and when it began to be revealed to me that I found it there was so much uh, isolated from uh, man's thinking, from old tradition that's been taught for years and years, separate me from the company and they'll walk off and leave me. But he let me know I wasn't the only one. They walked off and left him when he brought forth the understanding of truth. They all walked off but the twelve. And he turned around and said, Will you also go away? Peter said, To whom shall we go? Seeing thou hast the words of eternal life. <laughs> I feel anointed this morning for some reason. <laughs> We're saying, May come to time some more and change up. Since I got to talking, I just, maybe I'd better complete this since it just kept rolling up here. Now we think of the time that I would say we've heard so much of all the goodness that yet to come. We hear so much preached over this land. Jesus had never appeared. I heard a man preaching to the other son of this Sarah Herbert. W. Armstrong, Pasadena, California. He was telling this world that Jesus hadn't come yet to be King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And there's millions of people listening at his message. I want to tell Mr. Armstrong, if Jesus is not in charge today, I'd like to ask him who is. Because Jesus, when he showed earth, he said, All power in heaven and in earth is given unto me under that band gate. And when this plan was fulfilled, Jesus appeared on the scene and on the seat of judgment to be King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And today He is our ruler. We are under His dominion and His authority. In Him we live and move and have our beings. And we He bought us with a price and He brought us reconciled each and every one into his body and we all are his and he said we was complete in him brother kinder if you will come on up here and sit out bobby brother I, and, and uh we'll we'll give you an opportunity to talk for us in a little while and jim he wants the same question i want to finish my talk up first and i appreciate it you. Uh, you know <laughs> I got love this brother because he's got a message. 
We harmonize together as our message. And <laughs> we, you know, when two walk together, they can agree. We walk together. I want to tell you, you've got something to bless you with, too. But while I'm talking, I want to say something here concerning the Scriptures. And then Jim wants to sing us a song. And Brother Kinder, somebody wants to testify, all right. I want to read from the book of Colossians, if you'd like to turn to it. Now, these Colossian people were Gentile people. Of course, in the second chapter of, that, of the Colossians, uh, Paul was speaking to a mixed group of both Jews and Gentiles of how we all was buried with him by baptism and the death, how we was all reconciled unto God by the death of his son. Now, if I can get this over to people today of the word reconciliation, of what it meant, what it means, and I believe most of you know that reconciled, being reconciled unto God was being drawn unto him. And everyone being reconciled together was like bringing together a bunch of flowers, different flowers, and putting them all into one body. What he did for every nation, kindred and tongue. Right. And he would reconcile the whole world unto himself. Whether it's in heaven or in earth, everything was reconciled unto him. And if we can get people to wake up today to know that that was in God's plan and that reconciliation came, and his plan was fulfilled, and <laughs> we're all one in God. That's right. His prophecy was fulfilled when he prayed and his prayer was answered. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed to the Father to make us all one, even as he and his Father is one, and he came here to his baptism and reconciled us all and baptized us all together into this body, which is the, uh, the church, and he made us all one, Jew, Gentile, bond, and free. It's already completed. It's not to be completed. It's already happened. We just need to know today how to submit ourselves to His will, to understand His message, His uh, His plan, and to walk therein. Right. But there's so many that's not walking in it. They're in the negative side of life. They're walking in everything else but righteousness. And that's the one that's going to suffer the wrath. That's the one that is suffering the wrath. I want to tell you, we've got something today to wake up to that our life is hid with Christ in God, that we're in Him. We need to know Him. I was thinking right. today how wonderful it is today of uh, so much around us that we've got to enjoy. Of all our good homes and our cars and a lot to eat and all. There's no need of no one going in a depressed feeling or feel down and out that they don't feel like a, that they're uh, protected. I want to tell you, if we will trust in God, we've got all the protection we need. Now here's what Paul is saying to the Colossian people. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now this is Paul talking to the Colossian church. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. See, Paul called church members and otherwise people that, you know, had repented and accepted God. He called them saints. We call them Christians. Uh, and they do call that. There's a place in the Bible they do call them Christians. But Paul referred to them as saints. Now, he said, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Uh, he said, You heard of it before, which is common to you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Did you know that verse will take us right back to Jesus' talk in the 21st chapter of Luke when he told them about carrying this message into all the world as a witness to all nations and then shall the end be? 
So many today don't see that that end has come. They're still looking for that world end. It's not talking about this planet Earth. The word that he was talking about was a church age under the law, an age that was coming to a close. And when it did, then he was coming on the seat of judgment and he was coming to be king of kings. And all of this happened. They carried this into the end of the world. Now listen to what he said. Which is, this message now, it talking to Colossians, which has come unto you as it is in all the world. Ha! Does that not give us to know that it, saw, it went into all the world just like Jesus said to take it to all ends of the earth and all the world? When you go to the 10th chapter of Romans and 18th verse, you'll find that these apostles carried it. This unto all the ends of the earth and it was completed. And our leaders over this land today are still telling the nations that all this message is yet to go into all the world. It was completed. It was sent into all the world nearly 2,000 years ago. Now, listen. I'll try to rush through this. I don't want to go too fast, though, because it's important. He said, I also learned of Ephesus, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this call we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's the like in today. That's one thing they said, oh, Brother Cleet, aside on. But I want to tell you, if they're of just truth and knowledge and wisdom, they'll, they've got as far as they'll ever get until they have an open mind and willing to accept the truth as it is, Brother Kenton. I said that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. We never know too much. And he set us to grow in it too, didn't he? We can't stop. Yeah. We don't know too much. I don't know too much. Brother Kendrick don't. But I tell you, there's room for more knowledge yeah. and understanding. And it gets greater all the time. It does for me. The more I meditate upon the Word of God and the revelation of the Spirit works of me, the greater I see of the blessings of God that has He brought here to mankind. Uh, the promise that He made to our father Abraham, that truth, that uh, all nations, this promise that He made to Abraham, that in Him shall, and his, through His seed shall all nations be blessed. That included the old little colored boy, the yellow boy, and everyone that's a human being living. Give it thanks to the Father which hath, hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So this inheritance that we're talking about now, that belongs, that's yours if you'll accept it. When we come to think about our inheritance in God, <laughs> oh my, if you could just wake up today and to realize what that inheritance was, I'm telling you, you would make a break to get to somewhere that you could hear something that's, that's, uh, uh, that would benefit you. You might say, Brother Cleet, you waited by the law to become so wise to this, but maybe, maybe, maybe God had a purpose in it. I'm going to tell you, Abraham wasn't too old. He lived, he was 90 years old before he was even circumcised. He was 100 years old when he got old Isaac. I tell you, I'm still a young man. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. Let's, let's get our mind on what we're talking about this morning. You'll be blessed. You'll hear something here. And I know it that God has put in my heart and mind to talk to you this morning that will bring some enlightenment to you and to all of us that we can be more established on the foundation and realize there's our only one foundation and it's already laid and there's no other foundation to be laid except that which is already laid. Amen. Now man can get out here, you see that all over the land. They are building new foundations. They are laying new plans and building up organizations writing up bylaws and articles of faith, 
But I want to tell you, it's all just right in here and complete. And if we realize that there's only one foundation and it's already laid and there'll never be another one. The building is already built. It'll never be built again. The building is not in building no more. It is finished. It's complete. We get that. Can we believe that? Doesn't the tender agree with me? He knows what I'm talking about. He knows it. Now here's what he said. Paul is telling these people. It's been translated, you see. Brought forth from out from under this bondage of this law of sin and death. Brought forth into the liberty of Christ. And he said now, Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, who hath, not going to be, who hath, I'm reading the 13th, chapter, 13th verse of the first chapter of Colossians, who hath delivered us from the powers of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Already have you been translated a long time ago. And when you were translated a long time ago, is when you was buried by baptism into the body of his death. And the body of his death was his church that become dead to this law, and had to come to the resurrection to live with Christ. Right. Thank you, Brother Kendrick. <laughs> In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image? Now, here's where he's talking about Jesus. I want us to get the rest of this chapter now. Armstrong can disagree with me if he wants to, but I've got scripture for Brother Armstrong. And lots of, I know that, and Brother Kendrick knows that. <laughs> Thank you, good Lord. Now listen here. For by him were all things. Excuse me. By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether, where, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, not part of them, but all things were created by him and for him. Right. He's in charge. And he's our king. We're under his dominion. Mr. Armstrong can deny it if he wants to. Somebody talked to me over the phone the other day. I said, Brother Clayton, I've been reading the books of after uh, Herbert W. Armstrong. I said, my, my. I said, that man's preaching dead prophets. It's been fulfilled nearly 2,000 years ago. He said, in this nation, that all of us yet to be. The Arm Battle of Armageddon and all this is to take place. When I said that began at the day of Pentecost and the controversy between the two laws. All the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. Now listen. What I said to you a while ago in the beginning and he is before all things. And by him all things consist. If all things today consist, then Brother Armstrong says he's not king yet, he's not the ruler. I tell you, that may be a smart man over there, and he's got millions of people listening at him, and he's got lots of money going into him. But I want to tell you, Brother Armstrong better read his Bible. He better repent. And, uh, and go to telling people that our king is now ruling. Sure is. That he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. And this kingdom that he's ruling over is his church, his people, his government. And he, this, this dominion that he has, that he said he was going to rule over this house of Jacob forever. Right. That regeneration came. That translation came. And we was a reborn uh, Christians. Otherwise, we come into the new birth, we come to be the child of the new Jerusalem, the mother of us all. Why? Okay. <laughs> that is Bible. I can go to you and read it to you in Galatians. 
I want to get young like Brother Kim, you know. I, I, we, we, want to, we want to just get this thing going all over this world. I'm going to tell you, Brother Kim, that we're just believers enough. God will just give us plenty of power, grit, and grace to carry this message to Washington, D.C., and all over this world. And uh, We may be persecuted, put in jail, called Antichrist, and all like that, but we are, are anyway. But I'm going to tell you, this is not old Brother Cleek's talk. He was... He was too dumb to know this before. So it, it's not going to go too much longer, but I'm hoping you're receiving this this morning. It's being recorded here if you want to hear it again. I hope it is. <laughs> Listen to what he said here. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning. When, when was the beginning? Back out of when God created him in the Garden of Eden in the image of God. And he is the head of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. You know what that means. For it, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Get that now. I'm talking about God's plan when I say in Him all the fullness dwells. I mean Jesus came here with His baptism and full, fulfilled God's plan and completed it and to come to be the ruler and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we just got to waken up to this today to know that we're in this and we've got an inheritance in it and we just need to submit ourselves to His will and to walk therein. Why? Wow. I want to tell you, this here is healing. Did you know it? Yeah. This is healing. Yeah. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. I just said a while ago that the whole world, everything in heaven and in earth was reconciled unto God by the death of his son. And if they'll understand this death of his son that reconciled us unto him by was referring to the baptism of the Holy Ghost that buried us and planted us together and translated us into this body and made us one in God. That's right. All right. Did you know one place Paul said, Behold, talking about Jesus, said, Behold, I come in the volume of the book. Think about what the volume of the book is. It's the whole thing from the beginning to the ending. That's why he said, I am Alpha Omega, the beginning and the ending. He completed God's will, and God sent him here to do that. And if we'll understand this today, and of his move, and how this was fulfilled, and how this change came, and the regeneration of how it came from uh, the law of sin and death into the, into the law of the spirit of life and was regenerated and born again and become to be a spiritual being. I mean, a, in a spiritual birth. No more of the bond child of the church wow. under the law. Listen to what it said now. To be. And the PTL program was trying to work up something to carry it into all the world when the poor people should look and see that it's been carried there nearly 2,000 years ago. His witnesses carried this message into all the end of the world. And then the end comes. The change comes. That's what Paul says about it. Now, this is not my words. If they want to deny this, just go over and tell Paul that, Paul, you made a mistake. You told us something wrong. Now, here's what he says. Listen how plain. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. And they're saying it's yet to be preached. When Paul told them it was, if you got your Bibles, just turn to that 21st verse, 23rd verse, sir, in the first chapter of Colossians, and read this. Now, Paul wasn't wrong. And why is it now? Maybe it's a purpose. We say, well, why is it we're just we're waiting on that today? God's got a purpose and a time for everything. 
but I want to tell you there's a move on. Let's realize. I feel today that we're entering into a new frontier of a deeper knowledge and of understanding of enlightenment to our people over this world today to know how to come together in peace and to live together in peace. It's working with the leaders over this land. Somehow or another they ain't got together yet, but I will pray that they will. Well, maybe that's all I need to talk to you on that. But I would like to say that this that I've talked to you on today, if five ministers over this land understood did you know there wouldn't be so, so much confusion among the church people today? They, they could forget their bylaws. They could forget the articles of faith. They could forget their little organizations to, to, that binds people in little bunches around everywhere and just say we all are one body. There's just only one church, the body. Now, I've not got anything against good organization to understand and the names they want to use. But what I want is the people to realize that everyone, I don't care where all they are, to Amen. And as I referred to as Acts 9, uh, 3 and uh, 18, that when Peter said, Repent ye. Now, this is during the time of the change when Peter preached this. All of them hadn't repented. Some of them had, and as many had been baptized, received ye. Uh, so there were so many that had never reached it because the completeness of reconciliation hadn't been fulfilled. They was in the act of this procedure being fulfilled. And when Peter said there in Acts 3 and 18, said, Repent ye, and be baptized, uh, repent ye, no, yeah, repent ye and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, that in the time of the refreshing shall, shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send you Jesus Christ, whom the heavens, I don't know it says send you, but it says, and Jesus Christ, whom the heavens must receive until the time of the restitution of all things, and you see, this is going through a procedure of a change, of regeneration. And when it comes to completeness and fulfilled, then he descended the second time from heaven. That's what, now, he had descended once before. But before, in the first time he descended from heaven, it is when he uh, descended into the lower parts of the earth. That, that was when he come. Uh, to become made sin for us all and to bear this iniquity he would come to be the curse and uh, then when he when he was to be lifted up from this and when he said when he was when he, he lifted up from the earth then would all men be drawn unto him he had to be lifted back up and that's when he sent it the first time back into hell And then when he descended the second time is when he came the second time to reward everyone. And, and when he did, what would he do? What was this resurrection taking place for? When this completed, completeness come and the resurrection to all that had been baptized in this body of death, it brought about an answer to Jesus uh, prophecy that he said the hour is coming and that all which are in the graves shall hear the voice of the Lord and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of them well, this resurrection came and when it did that's when the dividing time come to the sheep on the left, right and the goats on the left there's when everything was completed 
and had taken out of his kingdom everything was took out and offended and did with iniquity, and he set up a kingdom without any defilement. And he let us know then, those that kept his commandment was able to enter in through the gates into his city. The city church of the first moment. Oh, if they could see this today, Brother Kent. That through Jesus' baptism brought about a fullness of the regeneration. It brought about a fullness of the a reconciliation. We was all made one in God. The resurrection has come. And now then the, the evil's on the left and the right is on the right. And uh, we that was uh, uh, living today in the positive side of life is living in the righteousness of his resurrection that's in the kingdom of God where there's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And everyone that's not walking in the negative side of life is failing to, to, to uh, accept this blessing that God had made to Abraham that through his seed shall all nations be blessed. I want to tell you, they wake up to the fact and they walk off and leave such as this. When it sounds truth to know how for people to be established in the, and founded on the Word of God to know that we are, are complete in Him and we just need to take hold of the tree of life to live. I tell you something else too. Lots of people never stop to emphasize and to analyze and, and bring up what Jesus' baptism meant. Now, when Paul referred to, in uh, I believe it's the fifth chapter of Romans, where he said, while we were enemies, we were reconciled unto God by the death of his Son. So many people today, they look at the death of his Son as when he died on the cross. When that body they crucified and hung on the cross was a sacrifice. His blood that was shed uh, was a purpose of bringing about the remission of sins. And the remission of sins, see, didn't come till, 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 the, till they were baptized by the Holy Ghost that, re, that brought about remission of sins. This on the cross of him dying, the sacrifice was a type and shatter of what was coming through his baptism of a death, burial, and resurrection. And if they can stop to see today that that what Paul is referring to, that we were reconciled unto God by the death of his son, was referring to the baptism of the Holy Ghost that was going to uh, carry us through a death, burial, and resurrection. Right. Thank you, Brother Kendrick. And if they can see that, so this taking place, you know that's the reason why they don't understand this scripture in the 6th chapter of Hebrews where it says that uh, let's just turn and read to it. 6th chapter of Hebrews. And, and let's see what there's so many that have never come to the understanding of what Paul meant by that. When he said Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrines of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Now get this next year. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the word, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. I tell you when I read that one day there's something just over to me that so a great meaning in that. You see, this was a, during the time of this reconciliation. And they had uh, tasted of the Word of God and so on, and of the world to come. See, during this time, the, the world, the new world had come. 
they, it was, this was in the last days of the church under the law when the whole world was coming to an end. Ideas of the Jew, of the church world that was under this law of sin and death. That was this. Was, see, this year when we go to this, this uh, uh, going on, let us go on unto perfection. Going on unto perfection meant going from this being translated from this body of death into, uh, and coming forth uh, uh, otherwise in the kingdom of his dear son. Uh, and coming into perfection was Christ. Christ is the perfection. Lots of people looked at the old physical body and the outward appearance of man to bring about perfection. It's good to live holy and live as perfect as you can. But this coming in perfection was coming into Christ. And you see here now, he said not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead work faith towards God. There's still today there's so many ministers over this land behind the pulpit still trying to lay the foundation of repentance. See what I'm talking about? Now this repentance, we repenting of this, all of this uh, that they need to repent of and to change their minds and come into the mind of perfection. Now he said of doctrines of baptism, laying on of hands, of the resurrection dead, of e eternal judgment. You see, after all this is completed, and Paul went ahead in Philippi, the book of Philippi, I believe it is, it is in the ninth, at about the first chapter, I think I'm right. He was speaking of our vile body being changed. And when our vile body being changed, he wasn't talking about this old physical house of clay. He was talking about the church that was in a corruptible body that was going to be changed and was coming into an incorruptible body. So I think it's in that same chapter where he said, Now, leaving, uh, says, forgetting those things that are behind. What was it was behind? The fulfillment of this repentance and dead works towards God. And so on. Forgetting those things that are behind, let us press reaching for the high calling reaching for the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now today we have reached that high calling. All of this, this procedure, this regeneration has been fulfilled and it's in the past. But yet it's good for us to understand it. It's good for us to understand all the way back to the days of Adam. And if we knew the plan from the beginning to the ending, how that Jesus came here that God had sent him here for a purpose to bring about a fulfillment of his plan. And they're still trying to uh, work it out today and in a controversy and a fight in their minds over trying to come to a settlement of what's uh, to take place when it's already happened and we just need to understand it and to, and to draw it nigh to God and walk in what uh, Jesus come here to fulfill. I see, Brother Kendra, I see his plan was fulfilled. And how was it brought about? It was brought about through Jesus' baptism that brought about a fulfillment to God's plan. And during this time, when we all was translated over in, into the kingdom of his dear son, I want to tell you something. There's something else our church leaders need to know today. The king's dear son was this body of Christ. And it was of, see, uh, of his son. But after this, after we all was translated into this body, of, into the kingdom of his dear son, you know then, that's when Jesus, when this was fulfilled, that's when he delivered this kingdom back over to his father. And he didn't come in the glory of his Father till after all of this was completed. After the tribulation. And then they would see him coming in the power of heaven with power and 
of the power and great glory. And if they understood of what His coming meant, they all are coming, they could see us when we were filled with the Spirit. Jesus here all the time. He said He'd never leave them, never forsake them. But I want to tell you, coming in power, when they, He said He was coming in the power and glory, uh, He was coming here uh, to take up rulership over His Father's house, uh, to rule over the house of Jacob forever. Coming in power was coming to take up rulership, uh, to rule over the kingdom. And His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and His dominion is everlasting in His kingdom. There shall be no end. Today, He delivered this kingdom back over to His Father. Back there in the past, already happened. He delivered it back over to Him. See, this, this kingdom today, you know, we go back when He prayed that He, t he was telling them how to pray. They wanted to ask Jesus how, uh, how to pray. He said, Pray ye, our uh, Father, which art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. When they go back to there, they'll see that the Father's kingdom, when, when Jesus delivered the kingdom back over to his Father, and now then, where are we at today? This kingdom of God is this uh, house of God. It's a church, New Jerusalem. Church of the firstborn, and today in this kingdom, in this new city of God, is where the Lamb, God and the Lamb, is the light. We're in a wonderful day, the day that God has made, and rejoice and be glad in it. We have come to the time that is called the eternal day. We have come to the time, and Paul referred to that. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. This other old world under the law ended. We've come into a new world, a world without end, where the Lamb is the light and he always will be. Wonderful. I want to tell you now, if we'll just wake up today, if our church leaders would wake up today and to see that why they're standing in chaos and in a controversy in their mind and fighting a prophecy that was fulfilled ages ago and that prophecy now is dead prophecy. It's in the past. And Jesus knew that they was going to do this and he warned them about it and he let them know that, that in that time when it would come he said where the, eagle, where the carcass is there shall the eagles be gathered together. This repentance of dead works and all now is dead. They are fighting over the dead carcass and when they say it gives no life and they just need to wake up to what the, 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 the life means in God. I tell you, Brother Kendra, I'm happy about it. When I was waking up to this truth and got established on this, I said, what have we got to worry about? All we got to do is just look to God and put Him first and present all our problems and all our mistakes and everything and, and just carry on to the Lord in prayer and leave them there. Just say, I belong to God. I'm one of His children. I'm looking for Him to protect me and I just want to know how to walk in Him. And that's what to do. Your life will be happy. All of this in the negative side is say, I'm true. Just cast it aside. Watch our moves. Now, it depends upon us in our life now how, what kind of success we're going to make out of our lives. If we still got a rational mind and understand all these things, just, just uh, before we make a move into anything, let's think over it before we make a move, whether it's for the best or for the better. I mean, it works. I'd say even if we're going to purchase a home or purchase an automobile, uh, purchase anything. We have to buy on the credit. Let's think it over first whether we're going to be able to meet this or not. You know, Jesus gave a good illustration to the people back in his days that the king was going to build a city or uh, uh, sit down and count the cost whether we're able to build or not. You see what I'm talking about? If we go and make a debt, we better be sure that we're going to be able to meet that. If we don't, we'll get in trouble about it. 
So let's be sure to set out, well, am I going to be able to, to, to meet the cost? Just like Jesus told them, said, sit down and count the cost. What are you going to be able to, uh, to, to comprehend with that or not? And that's good sound judgment out of everybody. I raised a family of nine children. And you know, I, could, I, I desired to have the luxuries of life. I desired to have what was, but I knew that I just had to go with what I was able to do what I was able to uh, cope with. And I'd advise everyone uh, to be careful and count the cost. It's good to do that. I guess that's all I've got to say today. strong of God is until we become weak. But when we become weak, he, 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 he becomes strong. In our weakness, we're made strong. And our weakness is to acknowledge that we have made mistakes in our lives, such as even Jerry has made this, or said this morning. That You know, that out of that weakness comes strength. The Lord is our strength. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I'll go all the way, even into the end of the world. So out of our weakness, we're made strong. Yeah. We really are. Right. I don't have the answers to all things, and I, I don't understand why things happen. But things that happened in my life the past couple of weeks that uh, I know that it takes Lord to, the Lord to really help us and sustain us. And I learned a scripture that really come dear to my heart. And I quoted this scripture to the loved ones that lost a little boy at 13 years old. And I quoted the scripture that Romans 8 and 28, that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. The call according to his purpose. And, and my sister-in-law said, would you quote that again? So I did. And I said, all things work after the counsel of his own will. I don't understand the things, and I don't understand why things happen, but there's a purpose in life. This little boy, he, he, uh, he made a change of heart. He, uh, he really made a change of heart, and his life really made an imprint on the and I felt that love. When we were down there, when my mother-in-law passed away, that little that young lad just clung to us. He felt a, a, a special love that he was reaching out for something that would, in turn, come back to him that would sustain him and give him more strength. And he felt that love through us, and in turn, we felt it through him. And we had talked about it on the way home, how that he had reached out. And then that next day, while well, his life come to an end here on this earth. But that really left an impression in my life, or on my life. And I want to do better too, Jerry. You know, I think we'll probably all come short of the glory of God. But out of our weakness becomes strength. And we learn to depend upon God while He'll take care of all of our needs. Sometimes we wrestle with our daily chores of life and it gets to be hectic and we don't understand things and a lot of times we take things in our own life, own hands. And when we do, we start make a mess out of it. But I think we should all learn a lesson from what Brother Haston, your dad, said this morning that we should put God first in our life and we should depend upon Him and, and not make a hasty... Uh, choice, but depend upon God for the answer. And I believe that gives us all strength. I appreciate your testimony, Jerry.
And I, I know that God is our strength together. We're going to believe God together to, to work this out. There's no problems in God. Our problems come in ourselves. A lot of times things happen, not because we want it to, but things just happen. And we have to deal with it accordingly. And if we put it in God's hands, it'll come much smoother, won't it? Won't it? So I appreciate what you said, Jerry. It makes me feel good. Does anybody else want to say anything? Well, I, I'm glad to be back this morning and to hear the things that I've heard. I appreciate what you brought forward, Brother Hastings. A lot of people just don't see and understand the coming of the Lord. And they don't understand the things that have taken place. They're still waiting for it to take place, and it's already taken place. Right. And those who see it enjoy the blessings of God, not to look forward in some future, but here and now. Present. God is with us. And we've all received the fullness of God. That's one thing that I, I believe with all my heart, according to the Scripture, that He arose for every one of us. And He, he, he died... I'd like to say this, as I see by the Spirit, the blood of Jesus Christ, by offering up His life, the blood of Jesus Christ is a negative aspect of life to take away the sin of the world, to take it out, to blot it out. Not only did it cover, but it, it took away. It, it took away and it began to bring a fulfillment by His death, burial, and resurrection, ascension, and return unto our life it began to bring the fulfillment and the place of Garden of Eden, God placed it back into man. You see, man gave away his life and dominionship. Man gave it away. So in turn, uh, four days later, 4,000 years or whatever, a man called Jesus. He came, behold the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He came to redeem what man had given away and place it back in our authority. Give it to us. Yeah. All that he is, he's going to, he, he give it to us. Not going to, but he already has. Right. And that was the purpose of Jesus coming to, to reconcile and to bring about peace on earth, goodwill toward all men, and to replenish the earth. And to replenish the earth means to repeople the earth. Yeah. To bring it forth. The people that's called by his name. Right. And we're that people today. Not only this little congregation, but the people as a whole. God has, didn't die for one or two, but he died for everybody. And rose again. Death is a transition. Yeah. Passing from death into life. Passing from one phase. I don't know if you would call it from one phase of life to another life. In other words, coming out of the sleep and awakening to the righteous of God and walking in, in, in his life. Yes. The greatest gift of all would be the gift of God, which is eternal life. And that gift of God that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, that we might have life and have it more abundant. Everybody has life. I want you to listen to this. You may not understand it at this point, but I want you to listen to it real closely and study and meditate upon it. Everybody has the life of God. Everybody has a seed of God, the life of God within them. Now, not everybody is operating in the life of God. Right. Not everybody is operating in his life. Most people today are operating in their own little selfish corner, in their own little place of worship. In their, but, but this is not eternal life. You're going to have to come out of it, and we're going to have to come out of it and worship God and in his sanctuary, we are the church. You must become aware in your mind, in your consciousness, that God has raised us up and called us for a purpose, and that calling is to worship him. And let God have the preeminence in our life. Let him, let him be first in our life and worship God and him only. All the things that we were under, all the things that we wonder, God come to restore, to revitalize, to give us energy, to give us strength, to give us the kingdom of God, the authority of God, the peace of God that passes all understanding, all these things God uh, brought back and restored them unto us. You know what he said? He said, my peace I leave. And not only did he leave it, but he said, I give it unto you. Yeah. 
So there it is. All that God desired us to have, he gave it to us. Every, everything that he is, everything that he was, he embodied it in our life as a seed. And that seed of life, everybody has it. It's called, a, I like to call it a creative seed. Come direct from the creator. And that's eternal. That seed can't death, die. I want to show you something. You might think, well, if everybody's got life, why do they die? What do they do wrong for? Not everybody's operating in the seed of life. Not they're operating in the Christ life. But a lot of people are doing their own thing, and this brings about confusion and, and, and everything that is a, a, a negative condition it brings about, and therefore they reap that condition. They reap it. And you, you know there's no peace if you don't if you don't sow peace, if you don't think peace in your conscience, if you don't draw from the peace of God that God said, I leave and give unto you, and then we simply don't have it. You have to draw from what God gives us. Yeah. And that's really the key to it, right. is drawing from what he gives us. The fullness of time has already come, and we're operating in the fullness of time. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Hastings. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. They're thinking it's yet to come. But but everything that God meant for us to have, everything that He that He desired for us to have, He gave it to us. Right. And he reconciled it by His life. Well, let me read a little bit in Romans 5 and uh, verse 8. Romans 5 and verse 8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now God commended his love. He, he, he poured it out. He commended that love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. I want to tell you something. You, you might not see it, but we're not sinners now. Are we? We're, we're not sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now that relieved us and reconciled us by the death of His Son Amen. into His life by His death, burial, and resurrection as you already said. And of course the ascension. Alright. Much more than being now justified. A lot of people don't even think we're justified now. Yeah. They think that judgment is going to going to start uh, after we come out of the grave. You know, they quote that scripture, last person, those which are alive shall uh, be called up to meet the Lord in the air, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Those which are alive and remain shall be called up to meet the Lord. They don't even know what that's talking about. This preacher, he, he brought some good words that, that brought forth this, this young lad's uh, message, but in turn, he, he brought forth a negative aspect. He said, well, he said, this lad's going to come out of here someday at the sound of the last trump. And his body's going to come out of there and, and he's going to come out first. And I thought within myself, no, this body will never come out of this grave. This body will never come out of this grave. But the spirit goes back into God the Creator. He asked me to pray, including the service. He asked me to pray. And when I did, I, I, I began to pray that the Spirit went back into God. It's in God now. And I brought about an assurance that it wasn't that body that was going to come out, but the Spirit goes back into God, the Creator that gives it. That body is a housing. It's a housing. It's a vehicle to express God in. That's what it is. The body is a vehicle of expression to express God in. But the mind is the avenue of expression. To express God, to worship God, to, to have a relationship with God. Alright, so there'll be no dead body. There'll be no body in there that's going to come out of the, the, this earth, what we call earth, out there and see with their natural life. You know that. And I want you to know that. And if you don't, study on it and find out for yourself. But the Spirit goes back into God, the Creator that gave it. Our judgment has already begun at the house of God. We are the house of God. You know what? There's more, there's more disobedient people in the house of God than they are obedient. But they still belong to God. Is that right? right. They still belong to God. If I disobeyed my earthly father and I, I got in trouble for it, but I, 
I still belong to my earthly father. I still come out of the loin to my earthly daddy, early, earthly father. That's the same way with God. We come out of the loin of God. We come out of the mind of God. And however disobedient we are, God still loves us. He said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. That doesn't mean we're operating any, but that does mean that we have everything that God is embodied in our life as a seed of life. That's eternal. That's creative. You can't, you can't pluck it out. You can't take God out of your life. You say, well, I'm, I see a lot of people that's not walking with God. I, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when God put His seed, when He put a creative life in every one of us and give it His body as it pleased Him, nobody can take you out of His hand. Wow. Nobody has that ability to pluck God out of your life because God's one with us. Is He not? Yeah. He's yeah. one with creation. Yeah. If the world could see that today, Right. They would, they would, you got to change inwardly before you change outwardly. Yeah. Paul said to work out. Work out. Don't work it in. You can't go to church and, 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 and you know, ladies wear long hair and dresses and keep your makeup off and cut, you know, go through tradition like that. That has nothing to do with how you touch God. I want you to know that. Your dress code has nothing to do with how you touch God. But God is the inward act. Peace, love, joy, righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Yes. And we are the church of God. And nobody can pluck you out of His hands. Right. There might be a lot of people point their finger and accuse us and condemn us and all this and that, but, but uh, it begins already at the house of God. When we do something wrong, it's automatically just. Not, not literally coming out of a grave at the end of... Uh, well, a lot of people don't believe the Lord's here. You know that? They say, well, he's here in the form of a Holy Ghost. Well, what is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost, uh, Mary was conceived with the Holy Ghost. She was. So that that must be it all bears down as God. It, uh, I forget how the scripture goes, but I believe it said the water, the blood, the spirit, these uh, agree to one on earth, but I just remember how that goes. But, but Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost... These three are one in heaven. And the water, the blood, and the spirit, these three agree in the one on the earth. Yes. So God's, God's made us one in him. And, and we should know that. Yes. There's a oneness in God that God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I thank God for that. Uh, a lot you of people want to read that, Brother Kendrick? Yeah, if you want to. So I think it says the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three yes. are one in heaven. Are there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these agree. three agree in one. All right, these, these agree in the one. Yeah. So, anyway, the Holy Ghost is God, is it not? Yeah. The Christ is God. Uh, he said... Huh? God's all in all. He's all in all. That's right. He said, Now you are complete in me. Jesus said, Now you're complete in me. For in me dwells the fullness of the Godhead body. Yes. It all dwells in him. But what I'm trying to say is some people, some people think the man Jesus with a hairy face think he's going to come back and split a sky and and redeem us, everyone, and the dead in Christ going to rise first and, and so on and so forth. We're going to go up the air and... The Lord's going to fight the battle. Well, I'll tell you what, the battle's already been fought. The battle's already been won. There's already been a race and resurrection. Yeah. We're in a world today without end. Yeah. And that there's never going to be an end to this world. And the dead's already been raised. That's right. The dead's already been raised. Well, here's a scripture. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And then it said, well, up here it said, Likewise reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right. And then it said, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey in the lust thereof. But it goes down one place and it said, uh, uh, Sin has not dominion over you. Right. So, it don't have any hold on us today. If I tell you something, I don't know whether you believe it or not, but Jesus came to eradicate, to erase, to take away the sin, sin of the world. That was a purpose for him to come. And like you said, to unite us together in one. Right. I could bring it down. I'll tell you what, it would put 
it would make it either make it look like I was telling a fantasy or or the truth one. But but Jesus came come to release us, to take away the sin of the world, to fulfill the law of sin and death, to bring an ending to it, and to bring the righteousness of God and place it in our heart by the Spirit. Yeah. Praise God forevermore. There's been a releasement today. Yeah. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You've got to believe in God, else you're perishing in your own negative thoughts, in your own walk of life. You're perishing in it. Yeah. Rise and shine for the glory of the Lord. Not will rise, but has risen in our life. Yeah. God's here today. He's here today. We're here. We're in His kingdom. We are His kingdom. We're His dominionship when we operate in the same. And we become drawn from the life of God. And you'll find out that the deity of God his nature is peace and joy and righteousness and everything that God is in the Holy Ghost. And we'll find out it's right here. I'd like to tell you something that's, that, that's of a surety. This heaven that people talk about with their natural eye and the literal heaven, I'm telling you what, it'll never be. And, and I know I get in trouble a lot of times. I get in trouble. But it'll never be, beloved. The heaven of God is a state of being. It's a state of mind. It's a state of being, not just being, but in Christ. In the anointing of God that reproduces the life of God. Yeah. Heaven is peace, joy, right? So that this is a creation of God, whether it be thrones or dominions and heavens or earth or whatever. But some of them are just not eternal. But God's life is eternal. And the life that we have with Him, our relationship with God, is eternal and forever. And it'll never pass away. It'll just get great. It, 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 it's just beauty in the eyes of the beholder if you'll just worship God. You know, one thing you might see that's nice looking, somebody else might not think they are. But I've always heard the expression, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And that's true. And, and something that I might not treasure, you might treasure, or vice versa. Something I might treasure, you might not treasure. But you know, things only are, are, are not, they're temporal, but the things in the heaven is eternal. And a lot of people thinking that heaven is a far off place and a far off state. It's not. Heaven is a, a peace within. It's an attitude. It's, it's a, I don't know how to explain heaven, but it's an attitude. It's a peace. It's a joy. It's an avenue of glory, power, and authority, and dominionship, and peace with God. It's not something that uh, you can think up with your natural mind because there has to be a transformation of the mind. There has to be a, a change in mind bring about this peace of God. Yeah. I want to tell you what's so beautiful about it. He gave it to everyone. His life he gave to everybody. You, 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 we wonder sometimes, maybe, how that people have the life of God when they just get out and, and so unruly and, and all these things that contrary to God's life. We wonder, how could God love somebody like that? Yeah. How could God sit, I abide forever. Abide in me, and I am the Father, and you have life forever. Life is abiding in the consciousness, in the mind that, that has been transformed into the mind of Christ. Let me tell you something. We just don't grow overnight. There has to be a growing, and sometimes we even struggle. And sometimes we ourselves don't know the way of God, only to a degree that we have to struggle and seem like we fight in warfare. But you know what? If we just learn the rest of God and learn it, that He is our rest, He is our strength, He's our arm, He's our understanding. If we'll just turn our mind over to Him and quit worrying about everyday life, and peace will come to this house. Amen. And we'll, we'll have more peace we know what to do with it. And we'll start sharing it one with another. Amen. We let simple everyday problems in our life a lot of times beset us and get us down. I think Paul was talking one time to the church. He said, you did run well. But what hinders? Right. You know, we let ourselves hinder us now. It's not that the devil, the devil don't have no power at all. You know, except, now listen, except it be ordained of God. Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? Yeah. There is no power at all except it be ordained of God. That's scripture, isn't that? Probably, what, Romans 12? 
13 powers, for there is no power but of God. You didn't know that, did you? A lot of times, you've heard a lot of people say, the devil made me do it. We used to have people come here, uh, and I, I don't have to call them names, but you know who I'm talking about. You know, the devil made me do this, and I always talk about a defeated position. But yet, knowing, the, claiming to know the truths of God and the glories of God out into the hidden mysteries of God and walking in Listen, brother, if we walk in them, if we see them, we're going to walk in them. They're not revelation. They're not revealed knowledge unto us until we learn to approach them to our life and walk in them. You know that? Yeah, yeah. If we see God left His peace here and we're not walking in it, then we we just don't really have the revelation of it. Right. We'd go to walking in it, wouldn't we? I'm going to tell you something. i got about 15 minutes. All right. uh, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you know, a lot of people think the Lord cast the devil out of heaven. But I, I have a different view on that, according to the Scriptures. I, the adversary, the man, man in his own right wanted to become wiser than God. Let's go back to the Garden of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden. Man in his own right wanted to become wiser than God. Could I tell you what the disobedience was? Could I tell you what the good of good of good and evil was? You know, God planted that tree of life, uh, 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 which the life was his life dependence. Then there was another tree, in the, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Lord said, don't you eat of this tree now. Don't eat of it now because when you do, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to become God of this world, the gods of this world. Little G, not capital G. Not God supreme, but you're going to become a God in your own right when you partake of this tree of knowledge of good and evil. That doesn't mean there was a tree that you could see with your little natural eye. Right. That's not what it's talking about at all. But it was a place in God. It was a place in the mind that God said, Don't touch it now. You, 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 you depend upon me, for I am the tree of life. You depend upon me in the consciousness, in the super conscious, in, in what I am. You begin to depend upon me. But if you get over in your own self, and, and then you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. And that's what brought about uh, the first lie, the first disobedience, because man began to partake of his own sensual appetite. Yeah. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Man began to partake of his own thing and he wanted to be wiser than God. And it simply got him in trouble. God said, don't, don't eat of it. Don't eat of your own appetite. Don't take of your own sense of the appetite. If you do, and then your eyes are going to be blinded to what I am and you're going to become God in your own right. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. The first lie came when, when Adam and Eve, you know, uh, uh, that, that's when it, that the first, let me say this, the first act of disobedience was that they come against God when God told them not to. And you know what the Bible said uh, the devil was? He's the father of all lives. From the very beginning, he was the father of all lives. He was. And in him, there's no truth at all. I, I might have to read that, but... And I think it's, uh, if I'm not for sure, it's over in Matthew. No, I don't know exactly where it's at. But anyway, that's, that, that's where the act of disobedience come from. And let me tell you what it come from, or where it stemmed from. Could I tell you this and you not get offended about it? Right. But God planted it there. Huh? Yeah. God planted it there. It was, in, it was in God's mind all along. The, the lamb was slain in the mind of God from the very foundation of the world. Yeah. The, man, the man that God created, the, the first natural man, oh Lord, he just didn't have the ability, you know, to walk in the Spirit. Uh, because of his disobedience, he couldn't walk in the Spirit and, and he couldn't produce out of his loin. He could not produce out of his loin eternal life. He only could produce out of his loins what he ate. Now you see what I'm saying? Yeah. His appetite was of his own self to become wiser than God. And many people today are operating in their own sensuous appetite. Yeah. They're doing their own thing, and that's all they're producing. 
uh, 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 salvation that is void and empty. And like you said, they're, they're still trying to, uh, to work out prophecy. They're still trying to stand on prophecy. Still looking for the thing to come that, that God already said was here. They're looking for the end of the world to come so that another world will come. Well, I'll tell you the truth. We're operating today in a world without end. Amen. And everything happened was happened for a purpose. Yeah. All things work after the counsel of His own will. It was all in the plan of God that God planted in the mind uh, the, uh, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil that man would eat of it and become of his own appetite and bring forth after his own kind, because in God's mind it was slain already the Messiah. Amen. The Messiah that would bring forth and release the whole world. That had to, that's the way it had to be. That's the way it was. And, and that's when the first unruly act of God, the first disobedience of act of God come about. And if you want to call it a devil, whatever you want to call it from, but God created, beloved, now hear me. God created good and He created evil. And, it, and in its own perspective, it was all right. You know what I'm saying? But when man began to take of it, and then it brought it forth in his mind what he partake of, and he only produced good and evil. Let me tell you something. Good in its own self-dependence is not eternal. It's not eternal. You know what I'm saying? I don't care how good you are to your neighbor. If you don't produce that good within... There, there is a good and there is another good. A good in its own act, you know, try, trying to do something out of the goodness of your heart just to be doing it to think you're doing right is not eternal. But now, there is a good that stems from the, from the, the tree of life or in the Christ, and that good will produce more, more than, than good in your own self, what is it I say, your self-dependence or your own self selfish attitude. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's a good of God that is eternal. And that good, you know, eternal life is not yet to come. And boy, would I be kicked out of a lot of churches for that. But good, uh, eternal life is here to stay forever. And it's been here for, what, a couple of days or a couple thousand years? You know, one day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years with the Lord is one day. You can call it a, a, a day with the Lord or two, uh, you know, or a thousand years. But anyway, it's been here for a long time. Eternal life. What did Jesus come for? Wow. I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. A lot of people think the Lord came once, but they think He's coming again yeah. to bring eternal life. They don't think they got eternal life right now. Oh, Lord, I, I feel sorry for them. I pray God anoint their eyes. Anoint their ears that they may see it here to know that God eternal loved us and set us free and released us from the pain of death. Sin has not dominion over your life anymore because there's been a disannulment of it. God disannulled the covenant of death. Hallelujah. A lot of people say, well, the death, he's going to walk on it with his feet and we're going to, we're going to walk on it, honey. We've already... Death has already been placed in its position, in its place. Death don't have no more dominion over us. The last enemy, they go over and quote that in Corinthians, the last enemy that shall be defeated is death. But if they'd go on down and read it, I might just do that because uh, uh, if I can find it real quick. Yeah, uh, the last enemy, it's in it's 1 Corinthians 15 and we'll read 25. For he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. And that's the truth. He had to. You know, could I tell you something today that God don't have any enemies? Uh, it's it sure has. He don't have any enemies. If he did, he'd still be a reigning in the flesh. Wouldn't he? That's right. For he must reign. And, and if he was still reigning in the flesh, we would still be under the law of sin and death. There had to be a complete fulfillment to bring forth a complete deliverance to end one phase of life and to bring forth a phase that would never have an ending to it. And that's the greatest gift of all is God is eternal life. Okay? Right. Praise God. For he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. Now here's where people get this word. This word is, I don't know if it's the right way to say it, but it's in italic. He said, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. It should say, the last enemy 
uh, 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 this is not the right in the original Greek. It's not right. I've, I've got the original Greek Bible at home, but this is not right. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That's not right because the last enemy has already been, but it goes on down, been destroyed, but it goes on down. For he hath, now this is in past tense now. Yeah. He hath yeah, already. See, really, if you look at it one way, it sort of contradicts itself. Uh, but, all right. For he hath, now he's getting it right. He hath put, see, King James, it, 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 can I tell you something? He made blunders too. He sure did. You say, well, now that word is infallible. That's the truth. The word is not in letter, but the word is in spirit. Indeed. And in, in, you know what I'm saying? I know we read it here, uh, but, but the word alone dead today in their own thinking, in their own conscience, in their own mind that, that, is, that has never been transformed in the mind of Christ because they're doing their own thinking. They're taking the letter and it kills them. You take a word of God and point it here. And I'll tell you what, you just about put anybody down with it. But that's not the way it is, is it? The last, all right, for he hath put all things under his feet. You see the people today that are waiting for waiting for the Lord to destroy death and put them under his feet and everything, they're, they're thinking that God's still going to fight about it. How ridiculous. How so far back under the dark ages can one get? Minds get. For he hath put all things. I like that. A-double-L. Yeah. All things under his feet. In other words, all things. You know what he gave us that power to? He put the seed of God into us and he cast out the serpent. He said, now serpent, crawl the dust of the earth. You crawl the dust of the earth. You know what that serpent was? It was man's ideals, man's ways of worship, man's laws, and man's, the way man that worshiped God in time past. But, that was, but God put it out, put it under his feet, and fulfilled it and brought about a new law, which is a spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And this made us free. No serpent over us now. No man-made law. Man, no man-made law now. Of course, a lot of people operate in their own self on the negative side of life, and they get in trouble, and, and they're not happy about it. You know, right? People are searching. A lot of people are really sincere in their heart. I just thought I saw last night, and I thought, my Lord God. And I'm not talking about being critical to nobody because I know they belong to God. However, they do. But couldn't we all do just a little bit better? You know, like. Uh, I, I thought to myself, I turned over on PTL and I watched there and Jim Baker, Baker, whatever his name is, he, how that he was stressing that Oral Roberts built this 60-story hospital, faith hospital, and 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 was $20 million, I believe. And, and of course, you know everybody be charged for, for going there, won't they? Yeah. They can't operate just operate on a free, but I, I thought to myself how that, you know, that that they were talking how God told them to do this and God told them to do that and I don't know, maybe I shouldn't but I, it was sort of something come up in my life why, uh, maybe a doubt, I don't know but, but why would God do that when, when, when God these, these material things are not going to stand it's the things that are eternal if people could reach nuggets of truth would reach out and implant it in one's life, wouldn't it raise us into a higher position? Yeah. You know, really, peace begins in your mind. Right. Healing begins in your mind. Healing, yes, it is. It's an attitude. It's an attitude toward God, what God has already did. If, if, if people would preach the truth of God and people would hear it and understand it, be pricked in their heart and begin to walk in it, it would change the way of life. Healing of the mind, healing of the body, healing of everything, the soul. If people would just preach the truth of God and let it come forth, instead of so interested in trying to build a build something out of the ordinary. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that it's not a good thing, but how wonderful it would be to to preach the truth and tell people that Christ is here. And he's here to raise you up, to set you free, to bring your thinking un under control. Let it bring peace and joy and righteousness and bring it out like, like God really intends it to, to be. People are still preaching back under the things that's happened a long time ago. They're still implanting in people's mind that Christ is coming. The Lord's coming. I don't understand it. I don't understand. They'll preach the Lord's coming and, and sell out what you got and give it to the kingdom of God and they'll build these fancy things and all these. And I'm not trying to put them down. I just want to tell you how 
the, the things there are in the world and our mind should be aware of these things. Let us put our mind on God. The God that is within us to bring the peace and understanding of our life that we need. And, and not to put it on some things uh, material, but put it on the things that are eternal. Fix our mind on things that are eternal. So many people just don't understand. There's just a very small group of people know that, that the Lord is here. Right. And know the world has ended. Yeah. And they think, and, and, and I just can't believe this. I, I just can't believe it. I can't believe that this world that God created so beautiful is just going to come a catastrophe and God's going to, God's going to burn it up with a match and, and all that. I can't believe that. And, and I know I might be talking something that you don't even believe, but bear with me and, and, and try to love me anyway. But I just can't believe that God would, 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 would destroy the, the beauty that, that is in the earth. There's such a beauty in, in in a rose seed, there's such a beauty in an acre seed to watch it grow. I love, I love the the, the creative life. I, you know, I love that. And, and to me, it's it's beauty. It it's it's so glorious to plant a seed and watch it grow, watch it come to life, and then eat of that seed, be a partaker of that seed. Isn't it wonderful how we do? That? Well, you know, God gave me a dream one time, or vision, whatever you want to call it, but it's like that he was, uh, the, we used to take the uh, n a communion natural, we'd wash one another's feet natural, and, and God showed me one time about the scripture, and it's beautiful scripture, he said, I am the bread of life. Yes. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, not as your fathers did in the wilderness and, and now are dead, but I am the living bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. And this bread, to me, I visualized it in this dream or, or vision or whatever. It was the greatest loaf of bread that my mind could grasp. A greatest loaf of bread. And, and that everybody that was eaten of Christ was eaten from that same loaf of bread. And everybody was being a partaker of one another. Now think of it now. Break a watermelon open, we all eat of it. We've all partaken of that same watermelon. You know what? We've all partaken of the Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, the burial, everything that the Lord wanted us to have, we've all tasted of that. Amen, amen, amen. And that brings us into the oneness with God. That brings us into the relationship with God. People point a finger because somebody might say a bad word or smoke a cigarette or something and point a bad finger at them and, and accuse them of sinning and things like that. They don't even know what sin was. They don't know what it was. You said it a while ago and had the key to it. It, it was being under the law of dominionship, being, being where that we wasn't free, but we was under man's thumb and man's ordeal. And, 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 and God released that from it, released it, and put his life in every one of us. You know what? It just takes a spiritual mind, Brother Hastings, to know that God put His life in every one of us. Right. And I want to bring out Scripture before I close and show you that God put a, put His seed into every one of us yeah. and He gave it His body. Mm -hmm. He said, well, these people are unruly. I'll tell you what, there's a greater love of God. God's love just extended extended as far as the east as, as the east as the west. You know what? He really does. There's a love that God reaches out. You know, when your children disobey you, that one that disobeyed you, your attention begins to focus upon that one, and that love is just poured out, poured out. And I know, I know it is. I know I've been a daddy for twenty something years, and you all know that that love of that disobedient one just seems like you just heap it all in one one lump and reach out. I'm talking about, but your love just just grosses out in, in a lump. It really does. Praise God. Well, God's love is for everybody. Yes, it is. I think we've all sort of come short of God's intended glory. For, you know, that we, we, we've all come short of that glory. That's probably not a one of us hadn't said something that we should have said. But you know what? God's love is so extended out to us. His arm's not too short nor his ear too heavy. That's what that's how come what a God we're serving. Isn't that glorious? He said, I'm not going to leave you, and I'm not going to forsake you. Let me read this, and I will close, but it's, it's found in, in uh, it's 1 Corinthians 15. I've read it a lot of times, but... It, it, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be. Now listen. Shall be, but bare grain it may chance of wheat or some other grain. 
Now, as a lady told me, and, and, and you might look at it in a natural sense if you want to, but I like to spiritualize this. Yeah. She told me I was talking about uh, seeds, uh, uh, mustard seeds and, and lettuce seeds and all that. That's all right. They're going to bear forth and they're going to bring forth after their kind. We realize and know that. Once they're planted in the ground and got the right ingredients, rain, sunshine, work, they're going to come forth and bear grain of their own kind. But listen to this. But God giveth it a body. I want you to think, I could, I could preach for a week on this particular subject right here. That God giveth it a body. Oh, hallelujah. Let your mind go back to the time of his death. Hallelujah. That's what he's talking about now. That God giveth it a body. God giveth it a body. What was that body? It was the Son of God. It was, it was his life. It was his life that when he said, Father, it's finished. Into thy hand I commend my spirit. Right then, beloved, he was given his body. He was given everything that he was. It wasn't necessarily going down into that uh, sepulcher or whatever you want to call it, but it was talking about that he, he submitted his life into the will of the Father. Always done the will of God. Listen, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed. Now what now? Yeah. Every seed. And that we call the seeds of God. To every seed, what did he give it? His own. His own his own body. Now I'm gonna add this. You might say you're not supposed to have, but I feel spirit that we might be all in all. That we might be one in God. That's the reason He gave His body for right. to bring forth a relationship, to bring forth, uh, as you call it, a regeneration, to bring us into the place where is there is no death. That oh, hallelujah. But he brought forth that seed and he gave every seed, what did he give? His own, own body.